Tell me who said this. It does not take a majority to prevail, but rather an irate, tireless minority keen on setting brush fires of freedom in the minds of men. Anybody know who said that? Sam Adams. That's right. Thank you, Grav. Knew the historian would know that. Sam Adams, one of my favorite characters from the founding era. Sam Adams was not afraid at any point to vocalize what he thought, but at the same time, he was a godly man who treated people fairly and well. And he was well known throughout the colonies for standing as a son of liberty, one of the founders, and not backing down to tyranny at any level in society. That's right. Amen. So here we are today, and I want to ask you a question. There's two, there's two types of ships you could be living on. One of them is a cruise ship. And you know you're living on a cruise ship if you're complaining that the food is cold and the beer is warm. You're living an entitlement mentality, waiting for somebody to rescue you and help you and take care of you. We're all living on a cruise ship. That's right. Yep. When I started praying about what I would say, the Lord said to me, just tell them who I am and what I think of them, how I see them. So I'm gonna tell you how he sees you. He sees you on a battleship. He sees you more caring about what kind of ammo spiritual that you're going to have in order to take out the enemy's strongholds. He sees you as a warrior well prepared for the fight when you're needed. Not sitting back, relaxed, sitting on the edge of your chair, ready to go. Who, where should I go? Send me. Yes. Where do you need me? Send me. That's, right. That's who you are. That's who I am. That's who he's calling out of the cruise ship mentality onto the battleship mentality. You're asking for strategies. You're asking for ammo. How do I overcome evil? in my own life, in my own family, in my community, in my gatherings, in my church, and then how do I change history for generations to come? That's how he sees you and me. We are generational thinkers. We are not here to look back and say, oh well, we got through. We're here to look and say, I was there in the 20s when communism almost took over America. Whoa. What were you doing, Grandma, Grandpa, in the 20s? <laughs> when communism almost took over. Wow. What are you gonna say? Well, I was comfortable, I had my retirement. <laughs> you know, I made sure that my kids, uh, you know, got a decent education. That would be a shame, because that's not who you are. You wanna be able to say, I was there, I fought the battle. Many are feeling this troubling about the current fads in the church. They are yearning for more. David Wilkerson gave the best description of them. He said, God hungry people are saying among themselves, this is not it. There is something more. The bigness and the sensationalism of it all has left us empty and dry. We want more, more than entertainment more than big showy buildings, more than a shadow celebrity gospel, a shallow celebrity gospel. We want deeper values. We want to see Jesus. We want spotless robes of righteousness. What are their chief complaints? They see the world system operating in the church. They can't stomach the fact that prayer and anointed preaching have been replaced. The house of God is now a glitzy entertainment center. Wow. Yep. They are done with the egocentric preachers, with grandiose, expensive, and carnal visions that have nothing to do with soul winning or revival. Wow. They accuse these preachers of being distracted and even derailed from their first love. They are deeply hurt that their church punishes them for wanting a move of God but at the same time, caters to lukewarm members. What is the urgency that drives them? They see America on the verge of destruction. We wanna go back to doing things 
in total dependence on God. Total dependence on God. All right, several years ago, what did I hear from the Lord in my spirit, in my heart? It was this. I was assistant pastor at the time of a church, rather large church in the Poconos. I had been a youth pastor, a deacon, an elder, an usher. I had all the badges. I wore all the hats. I, I spent more time in church than I did on the job. And I have a full-time job. So there was a, a, a very... Our, my wife and I met on the streets of New York City, reaching out to, to, the, to the lost. Back when 42nd Street was not such a nice place to be in the 80s. I used to tell people I met my wife on 42nd Street in New York City, and they knew, the older people knew what I was talking about. The younger people was like, that's a nice place to be. <laughs> not so much. So we were committed to the Word of God and to witnessing for souls. We went out on our Saturdays as 22-year-old young people witnessing to hobos and drunks and and we go into jersey city the worst parts of patterson in new jersey and we loved the lord we were in church whenever the doors were open and we stayed until they closed um, that was our life um, several years into that 30 years actually the stirring <laughs> of the lord's the waters started stirring Amen. and there was an unrest that i needed to find out why and the Lord said to me, I want you to focus on rebuilding the foundations. Primarily focus on how early believers did life and how early America was established. So I said, yes, sir, I'll go to work. And as I started to study that and get more involved and see what was going on in the world as far as most of the world, how they worshiped together and early church, how they did life and who was the New Testament actually written to and where were they when they read those letters, I started to realize that the auditorium style was not what God had for us going forward. It was going to be the home church. I started to understand that the home gatherings we're going to be a place where God could build a net yes. that could hold the harvest. Wow. And that net had to begin to be strong in America because that net is very strong in other countries. Yeah. As a matter of fact, more people meet in homes than they do in buildings around the world. Much, much more. So the Lord said to me, Jesus is building something far greater than a Sunday service. Wow. So fill in the blank. Upon this rock, I will build my... Ecclesia. <laughs> Church. Uh, where's Leo? He left. But Leo said earlier about King James. Well, King James has another thing that we could be happy about him. And I say that with all sarcasm. King James had his translators take the word ecclesia or ecclesia. That was the Greek word that was used in that sentence. And he changed it to church. I won't say the Greek word because I mispronounce it all the time. But it was changed. Why? Because the original translation, which meant ecclesia, was a general assembly. Okay, simply put, a general assembly. A governmental term yes. that when Jesus said it to the disciples, they knew exactly what he was yeah, talking about. On, yeah. There was no mystery. Amen. Lord, what are you talking about? You're going to build your what? <laughs> You're going to build your temple? You're going to build a synagogue? You're going to build your... Your town, you, what are you going to, no, you're going to build your ecclesia. Oh, I know what the ecclesia is. It's been around for 500 years. Yeah. It's the governmental yeah. assembly of the king yeah. meant to carry out the wishes of the king in the region. Yeah. Yeah. They are the ruling council. Think of them as the city council, the town council. That's what Jesus said he was going to build his town council, city council, and the gates of Hades. Yeah. Death will not prevail against it. So the Lord of hosts is drafting a rulership-minded people who are willing to contend in love, humility, prayer, and fasting for the breaking of demonic strongholds. That's what he's doing. That's who you are. That's who you are. You are a people, rulership-minded, not beneath, not under. You are rulership-minded people. So the lockdown happened in COVID, right? 
And all of that nonsense started happening. And the Lord said, well, you, you know, my, we both felt it's an acceleration time. We better get moving on this call. So I resigned. I stepped down as assistant pastor to the dismay and wonder, and what are you doing? Because the actual reins of that ministry was about to possibly fall into our hands. And um, people were wondering, why would we leave if that was the case? Uh, but the Lord had other plans for us. So into the lockdown, a friend of, us, a friend of ours called and said, oh my gosh, we got to get together. We got to pray. And we said, absolutely, we'll be over there Sunday. So we started gathering. And then we started praying. And we started having ecclesia meetings. Many of us in the beginning took our cell phones out of fear, not me, but some others, and said, I'm leaving my phone in the car. I don't want them to hear what we're saying. They started thinking we needed to go underground at that point. Not yet, folks. Not yet. <laughs> then we started realizing that, hey, our group of, of eight needs to expand. And it didn't mean expand it to another building, but we needed to reach the community. And we needed to help those like us that were struggling. Why are we in this crazy state of mass psychosis? And how do we find people who do not speak the party line? Wow. Yeah. So we started gathering in a local hotel. Uh, we rented out their breakfast space and we started studying the Constitution together. Wow. And uh, we started also just at first it was a it was a complaining session, right? It was mostly just people getting together and we let them vent. And we did. We had to, right? And then it became into my, uh, my, my favorite cause kind of events where people came and they said, oh, we could do this and we could do that and we could do this and you should do that. I got a lot, a lot, a lot of that, right? Do you get a lot of that? You should do this. Oh, great. I'm glad you think that. Why don't you talk to God and maybe he could talk to me. And I, I, I'm from Jersey, so I get very, very abrupt with people like that oh yeah i'm glad god told you that tell him he's got my number he could give me a call so anyway god wanted us to reach out we reached out to the community and they started to come and then we week every week on thursday we called it our thursday night group and we would be very kind of uh nondescript about the group on purpose what's your group oh it's a thursday night group why don't you come check us out and it was by kind of invitation only you know we didn't advertise it we wanted like-minded people, and uh, sometimes people would come in and they were just confused, and we'd help them, and we'd walk them through, and sometimes they'd come back, and sometimes not. Uh, but the core group remained, and we started to grow, and our ecclesia grew into our home gatherings, and now we're at the point we have to, we have to divide up, we have to split, because it is not meant to be a growing point where you go into a building. The pilgrims, when they were under pressure, right, they got away from the system, right. their system, and they went into the homes. And they, in the homes, they had relationships with one another. They had accountability with one another. They formed the whole plan of where they were going to go next and what God led them to do in those homes, in those gatherings. So relationship. So relationship. That was first. But what was second? Adam's job description, and that was to rule. Come on, that's right. Adam's job description, say this, say, my job description, my job description. Is, to rule. is to rule. Some of you have trouble saying that because you think in the mindset of the world, like you're going to rule over somebody. So, like so you got to start thinking, I'm telling you, I want to encourage you, tell you who you are. You are rulers. You are rulers.